morning. Good morning. Good morning. And in the name of Jesus Christ, welcome to our worship service this morning. Mitch and Linda are enjoying some time away in sunny California. Although I looked at the weather map this morning, it didn't look so sunny. But <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, uh, they will come back well rested. Mitch will be here next Sunday. Uh, in the meantime, we welcome to our pulpit a uh, Reverend Doug Tracy. Uh, Doug is a uh, is no stranger to UPC. He has been in the pulpit before, and he also served as moderator of our session during the interim between when David left and when Mitch arrived. Uh, his bio says he's a retired minister. I think uh, semi-retired would be a better description. <laughs> he's uh, still doing some pulpit supply and uh, still uh, occasionally teaching at uh, McCormick Theological Seminary. Uh, he has held just about every position a minister could hold during his impressive career. Uh, he has held, uh, he has been a pastor, an associate pastor, uh, various staff positions at the presbytery and the synod level, and as well as, as teaching at the uh, seminary level. So uh, welcome, Doug. Uh, we look forward to the message that you have for us this morning. And we have a few announcements. Uh, we're still collecting for school supplies. Uh, the, the boxes will be there for another week. Uh, although we won't be here next week, uh, we'll be at Bryan Park, but the boxes will be here if you come, if you haven't had the chance to make a donation, uh, you can come anytime when the office is open, the boxes will be here. And uh, again, uh, we will be at Bryan Park next Sunday, so if you come here, you will be the only one here. <laughs> I trust that Alan will probably put a note on the door in case anyone didn't get the message. But there is a uh, note in the bulletin uh, that describes what's going to take place. Uh, the, <clears throat> I believe the hot dogs and hamburgers and drinks will be provided and we're asking people to bring a salad or dessert and uh, please sign up at the sign up sheet in the back in the narthex. Uh, I noticed there were only about three names on there. Uh, let's give the, uh, the people who are uh, putting together uh, this event uh, some knowledge as to who's going to bring there, who's going to uh, come and what you'll be bringing. Last April, we said goodbye to our friend Lou Tompkins. Uh, some of you who are new in the congregation may not have had an opportunity to get to know Lou. Lou was very active in the church a dozen or so years ago. Uh, and then he uh, went to work for a military contractor in Iraq. Uh, to make a long story short, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. A bomb exploded, uh, leaving him a, a uh, paraplegic. So Lou was not able to attend church in recent years, but uh, some of us kept in touch with Lou. Uh, Mitch and David both provided pastoral care during some of his very difficult times. Uh, Lou cared a great deal about the church and about his friends here. And he has left us $30,000 in his will. So uh, Lou, rest in peace with the knowledge that your money, your hard earned money will be well spent. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, I know Alan has an announcement about script. We moved up a uh, script order day because if you look at your bulletin, you'll see that they're offering uh, a lot of specials, as much as 18% back to the church. And we didn't want to pass this up, and uh, they're called back to school specials. 
and um, you can order them today, and then Stephanie will place the order tomorrow. Um, the expiration is next Friday. That's why it's only a limited time. So that's why we're doing uh, script uh, today. Uh, and I'll be downstairs, and Suhail will help me. We'll be taking orders. And um, as Suhail always says, make your checks out to the Suhail and Alan Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> and we recently uh, added Stephanie to the trip. And, and uh, second thing um, I wanted to say is uh, a couple of people have come forward and said, are we going to go to the Shawnee Summer Theater for their melodrama? And we haven't done advanced plans, but it is this week. So anybody thinks they would like to do that again this year, let me know during fellowship hour and what would be the better day for you. The 2 o'clock matinee next Sunday after our picnic or going this Thursday evening. Uh, and let me know if we get it enough, we'll, I'll call and we'll go ahead and make a, a group uh, to go out there. Are there any other announcements? Sue Hale. Yeah, we have great friends visiting us from Korea via Abu Dhabi, Su Kyang, Chan Ho, and Dr. Doyan, they were with us about 11, 12 years ago here. And back then, Doyan was about this small, and look how, how big and tall she is. And thank you guys for coming, and it's so nice to have you here. And <laughs> Anyone else? Sue standing up. She I has am. something to say. And I, I placed myself here so maybe the people in the back can hear me too. I got a call yesterday from Terry Smith, who is the daughter of Eloise. Eloise lives in Indianapolis now, as you all know. But Thursday, apparently, at 6 in the morning, she had a stroke. Right. And oh. she's now in St. Vincent Hospital uh, in hospice care. So she won't be at, Red, at Robin Run, but we're going up this afternoon. I did call, and they said, yes, we could come. So Nancy's going to go with us, and we're going to go after church today. Okay, so, um, and we I'll will. Have a better report later. We will include Eloise in our prayers this morning. Thank you. Anyone else? Let us uh, prepare for worship with a moment of silence.
Please join me in the call to worship found in your bulletins. <coughs> Neighbors and newcomers, families and strangers. We gather in this place built by God's steadfast love. Strugglers and stragglers, seekers and questioners. We each seek to follow Jesus, the compassionate one. Builders of bridges in fractured communities, those who stand on either side of walls of fear. The spirit of faithfulness calls us to live as one people, God's people. The walls between us have been declared invalid. We will tear down the mighty walls and build bridges of hope. Our opening hymn is number 435. We are all our one mission. Please stand if you're able. is hidden from us by our sins, and we forget your mercy and the blindness of our hearts. Cleanse us from all offense, and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires. With lowliness and meekness, may we draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength through Jesus Christ, your Son. In our assurance of pardon, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old has passed away, everything has become new. All this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us share that peace with one another. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Let this be with you. Let this be with you. 
something was lost. Specifically, he told a story about a woman who had ten silver coins. And that was all the money she had in the world. It wasn't a lot of money, but when you have a few silver coins, you have just a, a little extra that could help in emergencies. And she would check every once in a while to count her silver coins and make sure that they were still where they were. One day when she went to count her ten silver corn, coins, there were only nine. <clears throat> she began to look all over. She got out her broom and she swept the house and she looked under the cabinets and under the boxes and things where they stored everything looking for that coin. And she searched high and she searched low. She went everywhere looking for that coin. Finally, in a corner somewhere, she found it. She was so happy that she called all the neighbors and said, I have found my silver coin. And she celebrated, and everybody celebrated along with her because they knew that was really uh, all she had, and it was really important. Well, Jesus, when he finished telling that story, made a, a little connection between that story and how God feels about each one of us. And Jesus made the point that every one of us is just as important to God as that silver coin was to that poor lady. And that when we are lost and when God is looking for us and, and maybe we're not doing the things God asks us to do, God is anxious and worried about us just as the woman was about her coin and searches for us just as she searched for that coin and rejoices when he finds us. So he then says, help me look, help me search. And so the uh, disciples saw that their mission was to Look for people who maybe had lost their way and weren't remembering God anymore and help them find their way back to God so that there would be rejoicing. Shall we say a prayer? Jesus, we give you thanks for your love for us and the way you search for us. And maybe when we're not doing the things we are supposed to be doing, the way you help us find our way back to do what is right and how you rejoice when we're faithful and love you. Be with us every day. Help us to search for others, even as you have searched and known us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks for coming out. And at this point, I believe we join in the children's 
for today, and I did hear, was it Eloise? Eloise Sipes, and I have a couple others. Okay. First one is Ryan Blair, who is the, the Rhodes' son-in-law. Uh, they are up there uh, in... Fort Wayne. <coughs> Fort Wayne. Pardon? Fort Wayne. Fort Wayne, uh, to be with him. Uh, he is... Uh, having some complications of diabetes. Uh, I think he was improving a little, but uh, it's still very serious and he needs our prayers. Uh, Bill Schofield is having some very serious heart surgery tomorrow. I believe it's tomorrow. And Bill is here. I don't know if he wants to add anything or not. <laughs> Any other joys or concerns? Yes, please. Peggy is back with us. Hey. Yeah, Peggy. Yes. Um, I spoke with Ed 
Orchard, Chicago, just sweet Orchard. He was kind of tired, so he stayed home today. Okay. He is going to be having um, heart surgery also, not this week, but next week sometime. I missed the name. Edge Cobb. Edge Cobb. He's one of our DDs. Thank you. Any others? Doug, let's remember the uh, five servicemen who lost their lives this week and their families. Yes, please. My friend Diana, who had surgery and needs some encouragement. Okay. Diana? Yes, sir. Then let us take our hearts and minds to God as we join in prayer. Gracious God, we draw before you this morning as a community of faith, as a family of faith, as friends and neighbors and journeyers through life, as part of this congregation. We can lean on each other, support one another, and do those things. We pray for one another. We bring our petitions to you on behalf of friends and neighbors who are in need. Particularly today, we Pray for your servants, Eloise, Ryan, Bill, as they face surgery. Also for Ed, as he has some surgery coming ahead. They face illness and surgery. We ask that you would surround them with your love and with your peace. That you would strengthen them as they face the process of surgery and recovery or treatment and recovery. We ask that you guide the doctors and health care professionals who will work with them and the nurses and all who will care for them. Give them wisdom to discern what is best for each person. Give them patience and gentleness in their care and grant healing wherever it is needed. We pray for Diane as she recovers from surgery. Ask that you would continue to encourage her and lift up her spirits. That her recovery may be, may be better and or regaining of strength come more swiftly. We pray for those five servicemen, four Marines and a sailor who were killed in the tragedy in Tennessee. We pray for their families as they struggle with a loss which is beyond comprehension. We pray for our country and we pray for the people of this world so often torn apart and so often divided and so often doing horrible, hurtful things to one another. We ask that your spirit would take over, that your love and your concern and your compassion could be felt not only in this place, but throughout our nation and world. That people may know your peace and your strength and your love surrounding them. Lord, we give you thanks for people returning to be in our midst, for old friends for whom it has been some time, others who have been away a short time. 
but we give you thanks as we draw together as a community. Lord, you know the thoughts that are in our hearts and minds. You know the burdens we carry, even when we do not speak them to each other. Sometimes before we know them ourselves, you already know what's burdening us, what's troubling us. We give those things over to you, asking simply that you would use us, feeble and frail though we may be, to do your work and your ministry in this place and throughout the world. We ask that you make us the instruments of your peace. That where there is need or want, we may step forward with a helpful hand and a soothing touch. That where there is confusion and loss, we may offer a word of comfort and of strength and of wisdom and of your guidance in all things. Help us to be your faithful people. Drawing together as we pray that prayer which Jesus taught us. Our Father, <coughs> who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It is my delight and pleasure to be with you this morning. I got a little bit acquainted with the church some months back when David had retired and I served for a few months as your uh, Presbytery appointed moderator. But it's nice to have this chance to meet more of you and to share <coughs> this time of worship. And hopefully our time together will be a time of growth and sharing and blessing for all of us. Scripture lesson this morning is taken from Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 11 through 22. It's one of the lectionary readings for the week. And it is uh, an interesting text um, in an interesting uh, piece of scripture. The letter to the Ephesians, most biblical scholars think, was written later on in the writing of the letters, perhaps as late as the last decade of the first century, so 60, maybe 70 years after Christ's active ministry, after his death and resurrection, after Pentecost. So written in a time when the church had begun to be established, but was still uh, emerging, still trying to discern what it was God was leading us to be and to do as a church of Christ. The church in Ephesus, uh, Ephesus was a Greek slash Roman city in Asia Minor. Uh, some distance away, mostly a non-Jewish congregation, mostly what they would have called a Gentile congregation, but probably had been established for a long time, long enough to maybe be second generation Christians. Um, scripture suggests Paul visited Ephesus at least twice on his missionary journeys, and uh, the founding of the church in Ephesus is attributed to Paul, although Paul did much of his work as the leader of a team, and he would have other Christians that would travel with him, and often when he would move on, he would leave 
one or two of his associates uh, there to uh, continue the work in the church and gradually to raise up some indigenous leadership. So this letter, written late in the first century, to the church in Ephesus, starting to deal with a problem. And because of the nature of the problems, the theme of this whole letter is built around the idea of being one in Christ, of being together, of being united, that there is unity in Christ. And that's the theme that runs through the whole book and gets addressed as we pick up uh, the narrative here in the second chapter. So we start with verse 11, writing to the Gentile Christians. So remember then, that at one time you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at one time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints, and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone, Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually, into a dwelling place for God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Those are really some powerful words. Some significant, important ideas <coughs> to get across to this church in Ephesus emphasizing the way in which two groups divided from each other, hostile to each other in some ways, are brought together and made one in Jesus Christ. Important and significant words because they were words they really needed to hear. I mean, they really needed to hear them. Because for all of the talk about Christian unity in this epistle, this church and this community of Christians was anything but one in Christ at this time. They needed to hear this message. The church in the late first century, as I said in the introduction, really was trying to find its way to determine what it was, to discern how it was that God wanted them to live and to be as people. And there were several competing points of view on that. One group 
very powerful, very important group, thought that, well, you know, the, the covenant promise, the promise of the Messiah, God's special relationship with the people was with the Jews. And so if you're going to be a Christian, well, Jesus was sent to the Jews. You have to become a Jew first and then a Christian. Biblical scholars call these folks the Judaizers. They were the ones that thought that Christianity really should be a movement within the Jewish community. And that in order to follow Christ, you became a Jew first, and then perhaps you could deal with Christ as a Messiah. And so they kind of looked at the others that were hanging out in the church that weren't Jewish, and they had their doubts about them. They weren't sure they really wanted to be in fellowship with these folks, at least not until they went through all of the things required to become a faithful Jew. Problem was, the Holy Spirit was busy. <laughs> and Paul and the other Christian missionaries of the first century knew they had a great story to tell. A powerful story to tell. A transformative story to tell of God's love expressed in Jesus Christ who went to the <coughs> cross for our sake that our sins could be forgiven and our relationship with God made whole. It's a powerful story. And although the early Christian ministries always started by going to the Jewish community, the synagogue, and the various towns they traveled to, they made no apologies about telling the story to anybody that would listen. And listen, they did. A lot of them listened. And the spirit was very active. And the church was drawing people in, believing in Christ, becoming faithful to the teachings of Christ, who didn't fit the category. Now, some of the leaders in the church didn't like that very well. They really didn't. That's puzzling, I suppose. You think about that. God is doing something, and the powers that be in the church don't really like what God's doing. <laughs> it happens. And in this case, you had a church in Ephesus, mostly Gentile Christians that others in the Christian community were looking at and saying, hey, are these folks worthy of the name Christian? Can we pray with them? Can we really have fellowship with them? Are they worthy? And some of them, some of the folks were saying no. Paul, of course, wouldn't have gone there in a minute. Paul had discovered the transformative power of Christ in his own life. Paul had been the epitome, the absolute poster child for what being a faithful Jew was. Trained in the best rabbinical schools and an absolute zealot for the Jewish faith opposed to Jesus until he fell off his horse on the Damascus Road, had a vision of Christ that turned him from the great persecutor to the great missionary. And Paul knew in his heart the power of God to turn lives upside down and send us in new directions. So he was 
vigorously, furiously opposed to those who would build barriers in the way of, Christ, of people coming to discover Christ and to know Christ in their lives. But still, that nagging issue, are they worthy, haunts the church, haunted the church in the first century, haunted the church throughout the intervening centuries, it still hangs around and troubles us to this day. I often recall, although I don't think I've told this story very much, I, I remember it often. I remember a time when some of those are these folks worthy to be in prayerful fellowship with us? Reared their head in my own life and experience in the church. I remember being a young pastor and having an ecumenical group of ministers together in the town where I was serving and we were planning an ecumenical service and my saying, well, we should plan to have a prayer of confession in this service. And one of the ministers looked at me and said, oh, I, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, well, well why not? He said, well, you know, I, I come to your church once in a while and whenever you do the prayer of confession, I just sit there quietly and let you do your thing and finish, but I don't need that. I must have looked a little dumbstruck. I know I was startled. And I said, well, well why not? And he said, well, ever since I've been saved, I don't sin anymore, so there's no need for me to confess my <laughs> sin. Well, I had to pull my jaw up <laughs> off the table. <laughs> because, of course, <clears throat> I differed with him theologically. And I think I differed with him experientially. And I said to him, well, you know, I guess I just don't see it that way. I said, Presbyterians are acutely aware that we often fall short of what God calls us to be. Our Theological ancestor John Calvin was very clear. He said, you know, that there's something about the human condition that says that even when we do our best, we fall short of the glory of God. And we need to confess our sin. And the joy of the gospel in confessing our sin is then that Christ takes that burden from us, lifts us up, and enables us to live in relationship with God, not because we're so perfect, but because we've been forgiven and healed and welcomed into the community of faith. I said to him that, you know, my hope for salvation is not that I would be seated before God and the angels at the judgment throne in heaven and explaining all the reasons why I should get into heaven. My hope is that when I'm in that place, Christ is standing next to me and saying, this is one of mine. <laughs> because that's our hope and our salvation. So we enter into a relationship with Christ that, it said that causes Christ to say, this is one of mine. You know, I don't think that pastor ever forgave me <laughs> for that theological insight. And yet, it's the question of who is worthy to be in fellowship with one another the answer is 
none of us is able to be in fellowship with one another because we are worthy. We are in relationship with one another because Christ has brought us together. Christ's love, Christ's grace, Christ's strength, Christ's gospel gives me the strength to do the very best I can to be a faithful servant of God in Christ. And that, I think, is the message that we find in Ephesians. Once we were far off, but now we are near. Now we are heirs in the promise. We might have once been outside without hope, but through Christ, in Christ, with Christ's grace and peace and strength, we're part of the family of God, the community of Christ, the people of God. Now, somebody once asked Paul, the apostle, the question, or perhaps Paul took it as a rhetorical question. Romans 15, you can look it up. But they said, well, if the law has been overcome in Christ, and we are saved not because of our own actions, but because of the love of God in Christ and what Christ has done, shouldn't we go out and sin all we want to? Counting on the grace. <coughs> and Paul said simply, by no means. The mischievous part of me always sort of sees Paul going <laughs> upside the head, you know. Uh, don't be foolish, don't be silly. What Christ does is Christ takes me with my strengths, my weaknesses, my tendencies to do the things I shouldn't do or to not do the things that I should do. Christ takes all of those and first of all, he helps me be forgiven from those things that I've done that have been hurtful or neglectful. And then he empowers me to do better. He gives me a vision of what Christian behavior should look like. And he enables me to do the best I can. I may not do it perfectly. Heck, I don't do it perfectly, but I do it as best I can. And in that, Christ walks with me, Christ strengthens me, Christ enables me to reach out and care for others. Scriptures give some of the marks of the Christian faith, and they talk about compassion, gentleness, reaching out to offer assistance or aid when there is need, talk about praying for one another, welcoming the stranger into the community, and a whole host of things that Christian people do. And says, this is what should be the marks of our lives, of your life, of my life, of all of us is that we show compassion, that we show love, we show forgiveness, that we do reach out, we do serve in the name of God and Christ. And we are able to do those things relying just, not just on our own goodness, on our own wisdom, on our own strength, <coughs> But we are able to do those things relying on the strength of Christ working in us and through us. And it's that that gives life to the church, strength to the promise, and truth to all that we do. So he says, you are no longer strangers to one another. Neither should you see 
each other as being parts of different communities. Because we're all in this place, not of our own choosing, but because God has brought us together in this place. And we engage in ministry not just because we think it's what we should do, but because we discern it's what God is calling us to do. We were strangers and aliens to one another. And God is saying through Christ, in Christ, with Christ in our lives, the question of who is worthy to share in this ministry is not the question. Rather, the invitation is to join together with Christ and in Christ to be God's faithful people doing God's work in this corner of his kingdom whenever and wherever we have the chance. Thanks be to God for calling us into this ministry. Thanks be to God for forgiving us, lifting us up, making us fresh and whole. Thanks be to God for guiding us to do that which we can do for his kingdom. Thanks be to God for forgiving us and renewing us when we fall short. Thanks be to God in all life. Amen. Now let us share our tithes and offerings. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please remain standing for our closing hymn, number 366, Jesus, Thy Bounteous Love to Me.
be of good cheer. Render to no one evil for evil. But let the love, the power, and the compassion of God direct you in all that you do. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Creator, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with all of us, now and forever. Amen.